This is State of the Union. Good morning from Washington. I'm Candy Crowley. Ukraine remains on edge today with increased violence in the eastern part of the country. I'll get to Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt in Kiev very shortly. But first, two people who've recently been to Ukraine, Congressman Elliot Engel, ranking Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Senator Ron Johnson. He heads the European Affairs Subcommittee on the Senate side. I want to start out with something that the president said. As you know, he met with German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, and had a presser with her and came out to warn President Putin of more sanctions in the offing. The Russian leadership must know that if it continues to destabilize eastern Ukraine and disrupt this month's presidential election, we will move quickly on additional steps, including further sanctions that will impose greater costs. It seems to me, and let me start with you, Congressman, that everything uh, that the U.S. has done, the West has done to this point, begins with, if this continues, we're really going to do something harsher. What is the definition of disrupting these elections in, uh, in, uh, later in May? Well, the, the, the elections are scheduled for May 25th, and I think it's very, very important that the elections go smoothly. Putin is trying everything he can do to disrupt the elections. And I think what President Obama is trying to do is work in conjunction with our European allies. They are much more reluctant to do anything against Russia because they rely on Russia They're tied with their energy more than needs. They are. Right. I mean, but, but the question is, I, I think if you look at what's going on in Ukraine in the eastern part right now, you can pretty much predict that elections there are going to be a little tough. No, it really is spinning out of control. And, you know, the sad fact is sanctions haven't worked. You know, all the devaluation of currency, the devaluation of the stock market occurred before the sanctions were ever put in place. You know, but basically that all happened right after the, the Russian parliament uh, authorized the use of force. And that's, that's when all that devaluation occurred. So all the, the, the sanctions, the threats of sanctions really have had very little effect. And that's unfortunate. Vladimir Putin is only going to respond to action, strength and resolve. He's not going to respond to words. And that's certainly what we hear when we go over to Ukraine. But action is limited. You know, when, when Americans hear action, they think, oh, we're going to send troops or do something, which clearly is off the table and is not going to happen. Would you agree that the sanctions thus far have failed to move Putin? I, I would say that the, the sanctions so far have been gra graduated, have been gradual, and I think they'll continue to be gradual. Have they, have they affected Putin's behavior? Well, I think they've affected his behavior. I mean, he has uh, all these troops poised at the Ukrainian border. He hasn't crossed the border yet. I have to think that part of his calculation is that if he does that, all bets are off and sanctions would kick in. Look, I'm for sanctions. I think it's sanctions that brought Iran to its knees because it hurt their economy, and they're negotiating with us now. And I think Putin has to understand that if he continues this nonsense, sanctions will bring his economy to its knees. His economy right now is floundering. He really cannot afford to, to be so um, to wise about this. But probably, I think, to the point that some Republicans are making that want stiffer sanctions now and, in fact, more uh, some weaponry to go to the Ukrainian government is that perhaps the Russian economy has been hurt and there, there are signs that has happened, but it hasn't affected Putin. So sanctions that hurt Russia aren't much good if they don't move Putin. Well, I think, you know, again, we, 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 none of us know really what's in Putin's calculation. I agree. We, we do need sanctions. I, I think we, we do need to consider uh, giving, uh, giving military aid to Ukraine. Um, we need to let Putin understand that any disruption, and I think Merkel and Obama said that, any disruption of the May 25th elections uh, would, would bring a what's response from us. What's your definition of disruption of sanctions? In, in this case? I want to ask both of you, Senator. What's, what's well, your... We're seeing it right now. I mean, and that, and well, that, for, that's, uh, as far as elections are concerned, well, what we're seeing do? right now, I mean, we are seeing, you know, the, these Russian sympathizers, and I would say r really Russian agents in many respects, you know, taking over administration buildings, f fomenting unrest, and now we're, we're really seeing this erupt into real violence, you know, people are dying, and that's exactly what Vladimir Putin wants. He, he wants to destabilize not only Ukraine, but he's, you know, he's been really undermining those, you know, those uh, breakaway republics f for years because he doesn't want to see successful democracy on his borders because that destabilizes Russia, or certainly threatens his power. And that's, Kenny, that's what this all is all about. It makes no economic rational sense for Putin to be doing what he's doing. He's only doing it to consolidate his own power, and we have to recognize that. So no, nobody's talking about combat boots on the ground, but he's amassing tens of thousands of troops. We're sending a couple hundred in. 
And I think what we really need to do is strengthen NATO. To NATO. Yeah, you know, we, right. we need to show some, some training exercises, and we really should provide some defensive weaponry, anti-tank weapons to the Ukraine. Right, and I wanted to ask you about that, because this first I've heard you, perhaps you've said it before, um, but that you, you do think we ought to consider giving actual lethal weapons to the Ukrainian government. Because in essence, people who argue for this say, look, we're not going to go in and help them. They should at least have a little more wherewithal. Everyone understands that they can't beat the Russian army. But nonetheless, when you're trying to kind of crush this pro-Russia um, uprising, maybe some lethal we weapons would help Ukraine at this point. Well, I, I think it would, but I think that that's not it. Look, our, our NATO allies, the ones who are, are the former Soviet bloc countries and and former Eastern Bloc countries, they're scared to death. Uh, they, they think that if Putin gets away with this, they may be next. Uh, we have uh, in NATO uh, Article 5, which says an attack on one NATO member is an attack on all. Um, NATO, the equation of NATO since the, the fall of the Soviet Union, has really been that Russia would be cooperative. If Russia is now going to be an adversary, the whole calculus of, of NATO needs to change. And by the way, uh, the U.S. provides most of the military aid to NATO. Uh, the countries are supposed to do 2% of their economy uh, for the military if they're NATO members, and they haven't. Only three or four countries have. So it really means that we're going to have to work in conjunction with NATO, because if we don't, then the NATO alliance is dead. Can you wanna, let, me, let me ask you just to, to sure. stand by with me, because we do have uh, Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt on the phone, and I, I want to see. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. I wanted to ask you first, what is your understanding right now of the situation in eastern Ukraine? Well, Candy, um, right now, I mean, Ukraine is a country in mourning. Uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk was, was in Odessa today. He made the point that the, the violence there on Friday was a tragedy, not just for the city of Odessa, but for the whole country. And I would say, um, having spent some time in Odessa just three weeks ago and spoken with a broad range of, of political and civil society leaders, there's nothing that I heard and saw while I was in that city which would explain what transpired on Friday night. And I think it, it, it suggests that somebody wanted this violence to explode the way it did. And I think at this point, um, the whole country is trying to figure out um, what happened, how to pull together, and how to make sure that those who are trying to divide the country will not be successful. Well, Mr. Ambassador, there's probably no time to beat around the bush. Do you believe uh, that Russia and President Putin are behind what turned out to be, I believe, the bloodiest day thus far uh, in, in this back and forth? Well, we certainly believe that Russia is exercising influence across eastern Ukraine. We don't have evidence of the, of the Russian role um, in, uh, in what the tragedy that transpired on, on Friday. Uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk used some very strong words today talking about the role that he believes that Russia plays. Um, and this is something that we hope an impartial and, and systematic investigation will be able to get to the bottom of very quickly. And when you're talking about the tragedy that happened Friday, you mean when uh, pro-Russian uh, demonstrators were pushed into a uh, back into the government building they were occupying apparently by pro-Ukrainian protesters and then the building was set on fire and uh, more than 40 people died that's what you're talking about correct that partially yes but also the fact that you had pro-unity demonstrators who were targeted um, by uh, pro-Russia activists mm -hmm. some of whom appeared to have weapons guns um, and most disturbingly um, there seems to be evidence in social media that some of the, the police in Odessa may have been complicit in allowing this violence to spiral out of control the way it did. That's something which Prime Minister Yeltsin spoke to today, and I see that he's already brought some major changes in the security uh, leadership there in Odessa, which I think reflects the, the deep concern. Um, about the role that the security establishment played in Friday's violence. Mr. Ambassador, the ongoing uh, fear here uh, is that President Putin, well, with these clashes and with the movement of Ukrainian forces trying to quell some of this violence, he now has the excuse he needs to move in. Is that the consensus there? Well, I, not at all. I mean, we hope that, Ru that Russia will play a constructive role. Um, it's important to remember the other, the more hopeful event that happened over this, this long, um, over this long May Day weekend was the release of the detained OSCE diplomatic military observers in Slavyansk. Um, Russia played a decisive role in accomplishing that. 
it demonstrates that Russia has influence um, and can play a constructive role when it wishes to do so. And we hope that that's very much the approach that they will take in the days ahead. Uh, but this is an extremely delicate situation, and certainly the, the extraordinary violence in Odessa on Friday um, has made the situation more fraught. Right. And finally, Mr. Ambassador, uh, this looks like a civil war. It certainly sounds like a civil war. Is there any reason to believe that that's not what we're watching unfold? No, I, think, I, I, I don't see that yet, Candy. What I see is a society which is facing extraordinary, um, extraordinary uh, threats of division. Uh, but where the, the, the dominant opinion in every public opinion survey uh, from every Ukrainian I talk to is how can we get our country to pull together again? Clearly, there are forces um, that are trying to deepen division, and sadly, some of those forces seem to be coming uh, from outside the country, from Russia. Uh, but the, the dominant mood in the country is how do we end this violence and how do we pull the country together again? Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt, U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, thanks so much for your time today. No, good talking to you. Thanks. So back to you all. You know, you see these pictures. You, you heard the ambassador. What does the U.S. do next? I feel like there are not a lot of arrows in this quiver. Well, let me first say that we've got an excellent ambassador, Ambassador Pyatt, doing a really good job, very dedicated. One thing we have to understand is how effective Russia has been in terms of propaganda war. When we were there, I was asking, what are they, what are they lying to Ukrainians about? They're telling them that they are going to, you know, that Kiev's going to, Kiev's going to be spending, they're sending death squads to pull people out of their homes. They say they're going to be forced out of their Russian Orthodox or Ukrainian Orthodox faith and, and into Catholicism. Propaganda war. So the, the propaganda is incredibly effective. We need to counter that in a far more robust fashion because we, we've pretty well stopped our efforts of providing information. The, the, most, the most important thing, I met with Prime Minister Yatsenyuk when I was there. The most important thing that they're looking for is th those elections on May 25th have to happen and they have to happen so that the Ukrainian people can exercise their free will. It is so important. Putin's uh, role, obviously, or his game is to try to disrupt them and then say that they're uh, I I irrelevant and that they're therefore invalid. Uh, but we really cannot let him, let him do that. And again, Putin has to understand uh, that, that sanctions will follow, tough sanctions on their banking sector, on their minor, mining sector, on their financial sector, will follow just the way we did it for Iran, if, if, if Putin doesn't stop his nonsense. To both of you, a, a final question. If Putin decided tonight to roll those tanks across the border from Russia into eastern Ukraine, what stops him? Nothing will stop him. And that's, you know, this is hindsight. But when Prime Minister Yatsenyuk was here, just asking for a pretty reasonable requests of some small arms, some ammunition, you know, as a sign, as a sign of strength and resolve, of support for Ukrainians, now, unfortunately, we didn't provide that. And again, I, nobody can predict exactly what would have happened, but I, I think it's that type of weakness that has given Vladimir Putin the, the, you know, certainly the signal that he can continue to do these things with impunity. We've got to change what, his calculus. What stops him is he understands that if he were to do that, tough sanctions would follow both from Europe and from the United States. I think that, that President Obama is, is starting uh, slowly so he can be in conjunction with our European allies. But he said there will be tough sanctions if Putin continues this nonsense. I want to quick ask you about a question that's out there uh, in Nigeria, where in mid-April, um, about 270-something, I think, uh, Nigerian schoolgirls, teenagers, were kidnapped by a terrorist group that is opposed to Western education, who think Western education is evil. Uh, there was a, an interesting article today, an op-ed by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times, in which in part he said, while there has been a major international search for the missing people on Malaysian flight MH370, there has been no meaningful search for the even greater number of missing schoolgirls. Uh, we've heard Secretary Kerry say this is terrible. The Nigerian government is apparently not doing much to help find these young women. We're told they're being sold to be uh, wives of some of these terrorists, uh, it, it does seem, and, and uh, Kristoff spoke to the father, one of these girls said, we need the UN, we need the U.S. to do something. Is there something the U.S. can do? Well, one thing, I, I believe the U.S. has been way too silent on the brutality, uh, the lack of human rights in the Muslim world for women. And I think one, that's one of the roles I think the Senate Foreign Relations Committee can, can play there is hold hearings, 
highlight that so that Americans, so the world sees this type of abuse. So it really is, it's about communications. It's about awareness. One thing that's true, the whole world looks to the United States, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in Asia. Um, there's no substitute for the United States. And we, my belief is that we need to be active and engaged. It doesn't mean boots on the ground, but there's so much that we can do. We could gather an international force saying, find these girls. There's 270 teenage girls. America has to lead. And that, that, that's, that's what's missing now. We, we simply aren't taking that leadership position across the world. And, and that makes the world a, very, a much more dangerous well, place. Well, I, I, I think we are taking a leadership position. But we, we do have allies. We have to work with them. I think we're doing it. And I think Putin understands that. Congressman Elliott Engel, Senator Ron Johnson, thank you both for coming by today. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you.